Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us for our fireside chat on telemedicine. I'm Barry Fields. I'm a sleep physician at the Atlanta VA Healthcare System, where I've directed our sleep telemedicine program for the past uh, six years now. Uh, and I'm also part of the ASM's telemedicine presidential committee. And we've assembled a panel of sleep telemedicine experts who will be introducing themselves very shortly, and they'll be taking part in this fireside chat along with me. So first off, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. And so to frame our fireside chat today, I'd like to provide a brief overview for you. We'll start with the introductions of the group that's assembled, and then we will move on to points of discussion like getting started with sleep telemedicine and the physical exam and billing and privacy and security and a lot more. And then we'll basically just wrap things up. Before I go any further, I want the other uh, members of our chat today to introduce themselves. So let's start with Dr. Inessa Donskoy. Hi, I'm Inessa Donskoy. I'm a pediatric sleep medicine attending at Advocate Children's Hospital, Illinois. And wow, our program has been practicing telemedicine probably about six to 12 months prior to the start of the corona pandemic we were really piloting a new way to be able to reach our older adolescents without having them to miss school. So they would be able to video in from a break in their school building while a parent would be able to call in from their place of work. And we really were able to start getting these kids the care that they really needed to thrive in those settings without them needing to miss time in those settings. That's been one of the things that I've held on to as we've navigated how to provide telemedicine for every one of our patients throughout this pandemic. And it's been, it's been the part that has been most intriguing. How much can we actually do remotely and how much can we really help? Great. Sounds good. Great job. So let's move on to Dr. Marty Martin to introduce himself. Hello, I'm uh, Dr. Marty Martin, and I'm a psychologist that specializes primarily in insomnia and circadian rhythm disorders. And I was first introduced to telemedicine when I was working with oil workers on rigs in Louisiana. This goes back about 10 years ago, because obviously I couldn't get on a helicopter and then provide services and then fly back. And then it was pretty dormant for a little while until COVID-19 hit. And then what happened with my clinical practice, it transitioned in about two days from 100% face-to-face to 100% kind of tele. So it was a pretty quick ramp up. And uh, I would kind of agree with Dr. Zineski is that it does provide access for individuals. And for me, the way that I look at it is what I may do clinically is the same, but the platform is a little bit different. Great, thank you so much for that. So from adolescence to oil rigs, Let's move on to uh, Mr. Dennis Kelly. Well, hello, I'm Dennis Kelly. I'm one of the nurse practitioners. I work at the Lewis Stokes Cleveland uh, Department of Veteran Affairs Medical Center. We're the third largest VA by volume in the system. Um, we cover a 22 county area in Northeast Ohio and have 14 based community outpatient clinics that kind of feed people into us uh, to be able to do this. We also have um, a fellowship program. We have four, four full-time fellows that work with us. And we started telemedicine about 18 months ago, briefly, as a response to the Mission Act passed by Congress, which required us to kind of decrease our waits and delays, getting patients into the clinic on a more timely manner, as well as uh, distance-wise. And some of our patients, again, are two and a half or three hours from our main facility. And so we decided that we would do telemedicine in order to facilitate them and not have to outsource them and make it easier for the clients. And then it really took off again, like most everyone else has when we started with COVID-19 SARS-2. And we actually uh, decreased our inpatient clinics to only two per week, their fellow clinics. 
And now the rest of our encounters, and we have between 35 and 40 sleep consults that we get per day, are now either telemedicine or telephone. And uh, so far, it's worked out pretty well for us. So we're looking forward to the future. Great. Thanks so much. So from Cleveland, let's head out west to uh, Arizona, I believe, with Dr. Matthew Traster. Hi, I'm Matt Traster. I'm a pediatric neurologist. I do epilepsy and sleep. I work at Barron Neurological Institute at Phoenix Children's Hospital. I've been doing telemedicine in one form or another for over a decade, predominantly as outreach to more rural parts of the Southwest. Uh, the biggest tidbit I would have to share with you is that I, I think telemedicine works great for follow-up visits. I don't love it for new patient visits. I don't love it for a neurological exam, but for follow-ups, gosh, it's, it's, it can't be beat really. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Traster. And uh, now let's head back east to uh, Yale in Connecticut, Dr. Christine Wan. Hi, I'm Christine Wan. Uh, I'm a pulmonary critical care um, and sleep medicine is my background. Uh, I'm from Yale University School of Medicine. Um, and like many of you, our telemedicine experience started um, with the pandemic. Um, it was, a, like you said, a rapid conversion within a couple of days of getting people on board. Um, and now it's, it's sort of become um, the standard of which we care for our patients. And we've found it to be very effective in terms of outreach as well, um, patient satisfaction. And you know what? It's, it's actually made us a lot more productive uh, in many ways. So. Great. Thanks, Dr. Wan. A lot of common themes that we hear already among the members of our panel here for our fireside chat. So let's get started uh, in our conversation. And at some point, we're going to take a pause and wrap up this session, and then the rest of the chat uh, will be presented in the next video so we don't get too long and uh, verbose. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Dr. Juan, you were uh, the last introduction that we did, so I'll go ahead and ask you um, the first question. So for Dr. Juan, how did you start implementing telemedicine there at Yale? What resources did you use? Yeah, so um, as mentioned, you know, it was sort of um, something that was in a way forced upon us. We had to rapidly convert our, our program. Um, fortunately, you know, our program is part of a larger health system and it was um, already, uh, it was already installed with, with the uh, infrastructure for telehealth. Um, it was a secure platform with HIPAA compliance and, and integrated in, in our EMR. Um, some, some providers were already using it uh, quite regularly, although none in, in sleep medicine. Um, so in that regard, we were very fortunate, um, though we know that we don't need fancy technology to do telehealth. Um, there were providers using FaceTime, um, Zoom, and, and other links. Um, and that's acceptable um, so long as it's not, you know, a social media based platform. Um, so with that infrastructure in place, I think one of our biggest challenges was really retraining everyone, the providers, um, the staff, um, about how to conduct um, meaningful clinical visits via this new um, technology. Um, I, think, I think it was coming and it, it was there and people were aware of it. So it wasn't too much of a shock factor. And it's something on our wish list always in sleep medicine. Um, you know, we, we had to um, also, you know, rethink our uh, staff uh, efforts because now, you know, we didn't require nurses to vital patients. We didn't require our staff to check people in or out. Um, so we had to think about how to deploy our staff into new roles. Um, much of it was in the effort of um, enrolling patients into uh, the MyChart function, which is how they access telehealth. Um, also, uh, there was a uh, staff dedicated to um, educating the patients, um, making them feel comfortable, uh, comfortable about using it, as well as obtaining consent. So there are a lot of different roles that they played, but definitely, did. Um, you know, we had, we had a, again, being part of the big healthcare system, we had the billing department behind us. So they were very supportive in all the regulations we needed to um, follow in order to bill responsibly um, by telehealth. Um, I think current, you know, the resources were, were kind of limited back then because we were all kind of flying by the seat of our pants. Right. Um, but one of the more useful resources I do refer to now is um, the website telehealth.hhs.gov. It's um, by the Human Health Services. Um, it's a really nice guide, um, a lot of information and a lot of links to, um, you know, big uh, medical um, institutions and, and societies that 
also um, can give you playbooks about how to implement um, telehealth into your practice. Great. That's a great resource. I remember when we were starting our program here in 2014, we really didn't have many resources. It was the next year that the AASM produced its position statement on telemedicine and provided more resources. And now there's an ASM user's guide available. But at the time, uh, there wasn't a lot. So a lot has come out now, which is good. As you say, though, you sort of, uh, a lot of people have felt that they uh, flew by the seat of their pants when they started. Um, anyone else on the, on the group have any other uh, input about when you were starting a, a program, what resources you found particularly helpful? And if not, I'll kind of continue on. So let's go on then um, to the to our next uh, question. And this one I'll, I'll toss to uh, Dr. Traster out in, in Arizona. So thinking about, again, kind of getting things started, um, how do you get consults or referrals to your sleep telemedicine program? Could be now versus uh, pre-COVID. Um, what does that sort of supply chain of patients look like for you? How does that happen? For us, it looks the same. It's always been, you know, basically interchangeable. You could book a telemedicine visit or you could book an in-person visit. So for us, it's always been the same. Uh, it, we've been doing it for a while. So pre-pandemic, it, it looks the same as it looks now. It's always been that way. We've had favorable laws in Arizona that have allowed us to do it. So that's the way we've done it. So about the same, I would say. Okay. Excellent. Anyone else having differences uh, with how you get consults or referrals? Things changed over time uh, or things pretty similar? I think for me, what I noticed in terms of referrals, there were a lot more individual patients that were reaching out rather than through referral sources. Mm. So I think that was one thing that I noticed that was different. Interesting. I'll add on to that. I think especially once schools closed, parents really lost so much of the structure that held their children's sleep schedules in place. And so we also received a great amount of independent mm. parents, even you know, as self-referrals for sleep consults. And we were fortunate because now we weren't limited to location either. So whereas I usually spent different days of my week at several different locations across the state, I could see a, a patient from the North on a day I would see normally ones from the South because I was doing it all on my laptop. Gotcha. I think one of the things that was interesting for us here in Cleveland was when this initially started, the number of consults actually dropped off fairly significantly. And I think they dropped off because people realized, well, we weren't gonna have clinics that were gonna be open and we're, gonna, were we going to be able to see patients face to face. And we in fact sent some uh, information out via the email links to say, look, we're still here. We can do these by telemedicine. We can do virtual uh, appointments and still meet the patient needs. And then the consults kind of just start, started to jump back up for us. But initially it was a pretty big drop off. So we were, like, we were a little concerned about it. Took a dip, yeah. So kind of from, from, from speaking about the supply chain and, and of patients and going forward to thinking about um, patient suitability. And so I wanna ask uh, uh, Dr. Martin, how do you assess in, in your practice patient suitability for telemedicine, just because they get in touch with you doesn't mean necessarily that it's in their best interest. So how do you assess that suitability? And that, that's a great question. So what I did is I'm gonna share my screen. I, I prepared a checklist because checklists are often a helpful way for me to organize things. And so no disclosures. So with regard to the checklist is, and this is not in any particular order. So I really look at access. So access to technology. So do they have the appropriate device? Do they have the appropriate also um, uh, instrument that they can use? And then also connectivity. So do they have broadband? How stable is their connection? For those that may not have internet in terms of connectivity with regard to their cell phone. And do they have you know, sufficient Wi-Fi? Then I also look at literacy as well. So literacy from two respects, one is digital literacy which would also include phone, if phone is the methodology, as well as health literacy. And I think that traditionally we look at health literacy, but overlook digital literacy. I think we have to be very careful about stereotyping patients. 
because we may assume that someone that's 21 years of age, if they have digital literacy, but in a lot of cases they have the consumption of media and entertainment and gaming, but not necessarily doing other activities. Or you might have the stereotype that someone is gray, then de facto they have no digital literacy. So I think you need to be mindful of your stereotypes. And then I also look at their chief complaint. So for example, if they present with something that appears to be insomnia, there is quite a bit of evidence, even from randomized controlled trials, that that particular intervention delivered through a telemechanism or an online mechanism has been proven to be efficacious. So that's another suitability that I look for. And then also their health status. So in terms of physical, in terms of their abilities, so can they navigate the particular devices? And then also mentally as well. And then for example, if they're highly distractible and they can't focus and they can't concentrate and they're moving around, then maybe they may not be well suited for this. And then for the work that I do too, if they are in crisis, so perhaps there's some suicidality, so homicidality, um, destabilization, then this is not the most appropriate uh, mechanism for them. And then I often start with why, yep. So during COVID-19, the why was there are no other options, but now it's a little bit of a mixed model. So what are people's motivations? And also what are their expectations? And that's a good time to tamper any unrealistic expectations. And then I think you also have to look at yourself with regard to maybe provider suitability is how comfortable are you with this? And also how comfortable are you with this? And what is it that you can actually do in terms of navigating it. So for me, that checklist is a good way of seeing whether this is an appropriate referral or not. And what I've done with some referral sources, because they're unsure of, do I send this patient to you or not? So I've shared with them that checklist and that way they know, we'll probably not telehealth for this particular patient. That's wonderful. And, and uh, those of us, I think of our own practice here at the VA, we've been more or less forced to do telemedicine because we just don't have, at least up until this point, in-person availability. But moving forward, many more of our clinics are integrated with telemedicine along with in-person care. So there will be a choice. And uh, for us, a checklist like that would be extremely helpful, in, uh, especially for those who may triage patients when they first get referred into an in-person versus a telemedicine clinic. So thank you so much for sharing that check. That looks extremely helpful. No, I'm gonna steal that, Marty. That's really good. Feel free to do so. <clears throat> I think we'll even give you credit. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> That's great, good. Well, hopefully uh, we and the audience can also benefit from that. Very, very helpful. So we'll, we'll move on now to the patient has been deemed with your checklist to be appropriate for the telemedicine clinic. And now they are in your telemedicine clinic. And I wanna ask uh, Dr. Donskoy how she handles uh, what's now being called the website manner. So your location, your background, all of that. You know, it's so interesting. It took me a while to realize this, but so much of the preparation for this website manner comes far before the patient ever dings into that Zoom room. So the same way that I approach my clinic when it was in person is the same way I try to approach my telemedicine clinic. I would never walk in with my email open, another project going on, my Skype open with my nurses. I'm never in the middle of conversations. I have my pager, so I'm reachable, but otherwise it's me and the patient only. So when I'm on telemedicine, my other windows are not just minimized, they're completely closed. It's me and this clinic and nothing else for that time period. Now, once I am in the room with the patient, I of course want to present a professional setting. So for those fortunate to have a nice office that's well decorated, that's perfectly appropriate. If your background is a little bit like mine with children's toys skewed about, you may reach out to your department because they may offer Zoom backgrounds even with your institution's logo that can be brought into your Zoom or they may offer you even physical like this circles to be attached to chairs so that you have sort of a monochromatic, calm, peaceful background 
so that the focus is on the patient and on your conversation with them and really nothing else. I think something else I realized over doing the visits is that when I'm trying to engage with my patient, I'm looking at them in their eyes, making eye contact. But what I forget is that my camera is actually up here. And so for me to make true eye contact with the patient, I need to every once in a while look up at my camera away from the patient's face, but for them to feel like I truly am engaging with them because eye contact, it's, it's everything in these situations. Once, once I'm in the room, once I'm in the room having the conversation, I really, and this is just an ongoing theme, I suppose, I just try to treat it as much like a regular clinic as, as I could. I introduce myself, I ask them to introduce themselves they're at home and there's usually people behind them. So I ask who they are. I ask how they're related. If they're doing something funny or strange, we talk about it. So much of the pandemic has changed our lives. So to have a little bit of normalcy and almost fun in the clinic visit, I'm of course a pediatrician, so that's always there. But it really brings a sense of normalcy back to the patient that this is going the same way a clinic visit would go to. And when there is a child, when it is a pediatric patient, I play with them. I giggle with them. I play peekaboo because that's going to get them to get a little bit engaged, a little bit more comfortable, but almost more importantly, it really lets the parent who's my consumer understand that they have my mind, they have my heart, this this is the same. And they're going to get the quality that they really, really expect. The internet's going to lag. There's going to be bad connection. My microphone might go out. Theirs might go out. So in those moments, I think it's very important for us as providers to also remember to stay calm. If we're calm, if we're not panicked, if we know that once everything is resumed, they're still going to get quality care, the patient is going to know that too. And I think all of that really makes website manner kind of optimal. Great, fantastic. I wanna join one of your sessions because it sounds like you guys have a great time. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. I wanna become one of your patients. What I a know. great website manner. You gotta do a Benjamin Button <laughs> reverse. I'm a little too old though. Um. Anybody else have any other tips or tricks to add for your website manner? I, I really want to echo what Nessa was saying is that um, having, I tend to look at patients' eyes, but when I do that, I'm doing it, but they look as if I'm looking below them. And I have a little green light on my camera and actually the lens is to the left. So I almost have to look this way. So it seems kind of, it's kind of strange, but I'm glad you brought that up because it is a challenge. It took me a while to even realize that I was probably looking down for most of my encounters. I think it's also important to set the proper expectations. Um, it is a much more informal type of situations. I think patients are a lot more comfortable there, but also I think we need to make sure that we, that we maintain that you know, professionalism and, and that this is a provider patient interaction and we don't want it to become too informal. We want them you know, to be able to interact with us and be comfortable, but we also want to maintain a certain level of professionalism. And I've had, as I think we've all had instances where you got to make a connection with the patient and maybe they're not dressed appropriately or they're not ready for the encounter. And so you need to say, look, I'll, you know, I'll call you back in a few minutes uh, to be able to do this. So yeah, I think that's important. Great. All, all helpful information and such common issues that we are now suddenly confronted with. I think we're all going through very similar experiences, whether it's with kids or adults or different parts of the country or, or anything. Um, you, you know, uh, Dennis, you, you mentioned expectations and I want to pick up on that maybe with you a little bit more. So in terms of the physical exam, so we talked about website manner, now expectations in terms of physical exam, maybe your expectations, maybe the patient's expectations, how do you handle the physical uh, exam? What kind of technology do you use? How do you make that happen? Well, when I first looked at this uh, 
topic, I thought it's going to be a very short topic. I'm going to say, really, you can't do a physical exam via telemedicine. And I agree with Matthew that sometimes it's better for follow-ups than initials. But then when I really thought about it and really looked into it a little bit more, you really can do a fairly extensive physical exam via telemedicine. I think the skeptics will say to you that like, look, this is not possible to do unless you have a face-to-face -face interaction with the patient. And I would say that if you're an astute provider and you can give your patients the instructions as to what they need to do for you and explain what you're looking for, you can do a pretty good physical exam. I mean, I think it starts out with the review of systems. You know, usually we wanna to say to the patients, geez, are they alert, are they oriented, et cetera. And that's pretty much addressed by the fact can they log on? Can they get on? You know, like Marty brought up the idea, you know, do they have the technical savvy to be able to do this? Um, I think then, you know, it's just a question of, you can see a lot of things. You can, you know, ski skin tone. You can see uh, if there are any craniofacial abnormalities. Um, Dr. Fields and I have discussed, you know, use your, use your cell phone light to have them open their mouth and look in. Sometimes you can be able to do uh, exams like that. And so, there are a lot of things as you review down the systems to see, uh, you know, what's going on and kind of where we're at. And I had an old practitioner many, many years ago when I first started NP school that said, look, just ask the patient questions. They're going to tell you what's wrong with them. And particularly for those of us in sleep medicine, when we always, you know, one of my opening questions with the patient is, how's your sleep? Tell me what's going on with your sleep. And sometimes the patient can tell you what's going on, which will then lead you as to what may be physical exam parameters that you'd like to see and be a little bit better at. I also think it depends on what type of patient encounter are you experiencing. So for those of us in the VA that have many outpatient clinics, community-based outpatient clinics, we have telemedicine clinics where the patients actually go into the clinic to save them time from coming to the main site. I know Barry has some in Northern Georgia. We have some throughout Ohio. And they go in and we can do a pretty good physical exam because we have a physical exam cart that has a camera. You know, initially when you're looking at telemedicine, I thought of the idea of being scopeless. You know, you don't have an otoscope, you don't have an ophthalmoscope, you don't even have a stethoscope sometimes. How are you going to do this exam? And when we have these outpatient clinics, the patients can go in, our telemedicine techs, which are usually licensed practical nurses can help us out. Um, we've taught ours to do uh, a neck measurement, to be able to perform a Malin-Patty scoring and uh, be able to you know, do an Epworth or a stop bang, depending on what the provider's like and gives us some information and use the cart and it's pretty well done. I know that Global Med is a, an outside provider that has uh, technology that's available for purchase. I'm not sure the cost of it, I'm sure it's not inexpensive, but again, if it helps you to expand your scope practice and see patients in a more distant area, it's good. I know that uh, Teladoc has a, a virtual clinic station that has up to 40 different add-ons for it. You can do EKGs, you can do uh, ophthalmoscopes, you can do otoscopes, you can do ultrasounds, all with this platform. So I think it depends for physical exam on what you're, how you're interfacing with the patient, whether it's through a remote clinic access, which is probably going to give you uh, better hands-on ability to do a more complete physical, or whether you're just working with the patient through their smartphone. And I think even with the patient with the smartphone, if you give them directions to say, gee, I really need to see a profile of you, or can you open your mouth so I can see things, or move your camera a little bit closer to us, I think you can do a fairly thorough examination and get enough information. Again, we're looking at what are the patient expectations? What do they want to know from us? And what, you know, what do they want to know for us? And they're interested in, can you take a look at my problem? Can you come up with a differential diagnosis? And can you come up with a treatment program that's going to work for me? That's their expectations. Then we have the expectations on the practice side. And the practice expectations are, are you going to be able to document what you've done? Are you going to be able to do at least a physical examination of enough robustness that we're going to be able to charge for it. And remember, you only have to review two symptoms in order to be able to bill for this. And that helps your coding and billing people so that they can do revenue recapture so that you can all keep your jobs and, you know, be able to do that. And I think it's doable. And I think as we go along with this and we get better at it, I think the technology is going to get better and 
I think that uh, it will be a little easier and we'll gather a little more information in the future. But I think a relatively thorough examination is possible. And if you're seeing some abnormalities that you don't like on the telemedicine visit, that's your cue that, hey, it's time to schedule this patient for a face-to-face -face in person in the clinic and get them in and get them further evaluated. And I have had a few instances where I've seen a few uh, oral abnormalities. I'm not sure, is it a, a are we looking at a torus issue or, or a lesion? I'm not really sure. I prefer to local dental or oral surgery. Um, anyone else uh, have any specifics regarding the physical exam? Any tips or tricks people have? Um, I will say that I, I've used the technology aspect of this, like with ophthalmoscopes and otoscopes and stethoscopes. Um, it, it, it's if you are have someone who's like in a clinic and they're they're in front of the apparatus they need to be in front of to have it work. It can work. It is not like the real thing. I don't care what anyone tells you. It's not like the real thing. And there, there's certainly no way to bang out reflexes. There's some stuff you just can't do. But when you're doing Zoom stuff, that's there. At least they haven't figured out a way to make that stuff work because you have to have like it's like a Bluetooth receiver on the other end the way it works. And so it's I don't, I don't know how it would work by a Zoom, but through the sophisticated global med platform, as you can see how it works, but it's harder to do it the other way. Yeah. So also, rang. There's like nine phones in this room where I am and I thought I had them off the hook. I'll also agree that not every telemedicine encounter is the same. For example, sometimes my patient is at home, but other times they're actually more complex and being seen by pulmonology, otolaryngology, in the hospital or in the clinic. And if I have that visit upcoming, I'll actually have my nurses coordinate with that team to have the telemedicine encounter with me on the same day. That way those providers and I can collaborate, but also I can have the input of their physical exam from that day. So I agree, there's, there's a lot of different ways to, to do this. I also, <laughs> depend, I also depend on my telemedicine techs, the LPNs and the clinics and that to give me some information a lot of times they'll um, team me through Microsoft to say either they had a difficult time getting a history from the patient or kind of let me know what might be going on that might not be readily available that I can kind of then zoom in on my history and physical to do. So having that person there with them, again, that I rely on as a, you know, a team member to give me information we need also is kind of very helpful. Great. Good um, guidance uh, from everyone. And it's always interesting to, again, see the different approaches. Um, so perhaps the last couple of questions for this session, we're gonna take a step back, kind of in a little bigger picture. So I wanted to, to head back to Dr. Morgan. And uh, before doing any of these visits, do you obtain informed consent for these visits? Does it depend on the patient or the setting? What rules do you go by in determining whether to obtain informed consent, document informed consent, and all of that? Yep. So the, uh, the quick answer to that question is absolutely yes, I obtain informed consent, as I would any type of encounter, whether it's face-to-face -face or any technology. And when I think about informed consent, I think about kind of these four letters. And if you write them down, it's H-E-L-P, spell it out, and it's help. And I'll tell you why it's absolutely critical to obtain informed consent. So first, the H represents just a humane relationship. And also, it's a helping relationship and a healing relationship. So I think from an ethical point of view, you want to make sure that that humane aspect is there because people have a right to know as to what's gonna happen, what's not gonna happen, and if there are any benefits or risks before they can actually voluntarily agree. The E stands for ethical. So if you think about you know, biomedical principles, it's first do no harm. So I think you must be transparent and honest as to any possible harms that may arise, regardless of how the intervention is delivered, and then L is for the legal. So depending upon where your license happens to be in the jurisdiction, then most you know, state licensing boards require that you do informed consent. And the P is for professional. So if you're a member of AASM or a member of any other professional body or association, most of them have codes of conduct and ethics. 
So I think the rationale is about the human healing relationship. It's about uh, obeying ethical obligations. It's also staying within legal compliance and being a professional. What I would add as a twist though, when you look at telehealth is there are certain technological specific risks and benefits. So a benefit could be increased access, that's a benefit. Increased convenience, that's a benefit. Um, some risks that may arise are um, security breaches that you can't control, uh, maybe Zoom bombing that you can't control. Um, so you also have to be very honest with the patient as to what those unique risks happen to be. And then you also have to be quite honest with them as well, because if a patient says, Dr. Martin, please tell me that there will be no breach. I can't promise that because if the federal government can get hacked, if credit card companies can get hacked, then clearly I, I could get hacked. So again, I think you have to be honest. And then once you give informed consent, it goes back to the digital literacy. So you also have to make sure you don't use a lot of tech gobbledygook. Like you say, oh, I use a HIPAA secure encrypted platform that's certified in BAAA. And so just to add to that, um, I would say to be very cognizant also of the state in which you practice and your uh, payer. Because I know in some cases, um, I believe it was or may still be in the state of Georgia, if you expect a state payer like Medicaid uh, to, to reimburse you for services, they may require an informed consent of some sort on file. So it may not be uh, optional. It may actually be required in order for your reimbursement. So it's definitely something to keep in mind. And those rules, again, differ by payer and by state. So it can get very confusing um, uh, along, along the way. So let's, um, let's head for our last question of this session to uh, Dennis Kelly. So my question for you, Mr. Kelly, is what staff do you need working versus furloughed in these crazy times in order to provide this care effectively? Well, we're in the VA, so we don't usually furlough many people. We're fortunate along that respect. But I think when you're looking at um, the staff that you need to have, I think you need to have a good IT specialist. Um, we have people here, particularly in the VA, that are working with us that provide resource to us so that there's training for both the staff to use this. And there's also training and follow-up and support on the patient side for them so that they can get set up. Uh, one of their IT people will contact them, kind of run them through be able to show them how to access the platform, make sure they can do it, kind of run through. I think you need good scheduling people so that they can help you as well if you're getting consults to come in so that you know what's appropriate. They can kind of contact the patient or get some information from the providers to see whether or not these are appropriate to be scheduled as telemedicine con consults. Uh, some of our patients do not have access to the technology and so we can't necessarily do a telemed uh, conference, but we can do a telephone conference uh, to be able to do that. Uh, they also help us with informed consent, although we're very fortunate that in the VA, we have what's called the virtual uh, medical clinic room or virtual room. And so once the patient is into that room, there's a tab that you can click which locks the room and no one else can access that while you're there. And it kind of protects the patient's uh, privacy, et cetera. And also as part of our process, we review with the patient their local address, their telephone numbers. So in case there is an emergency situation through that process that we can vir use virtual 911 to uh, access support for them. So I think you need to have that. So I think in the clinic areas, our telemedicine techs are important. I wouldn't wanna lose them. Um, they can room the patient, get them set up for you. Again, it's a concern that, you know, for a new patient, I get 30 minutes. So if I'm gonna spend 10 or 15 minutes of my clinic time trying to access or hook up with that patient, that leaves me less time to be able to have the patient interaction. So I think that's why it's good to have the good IT specialist behind you that can kind of troubleshoot for you. And our, our people here in Cleveland have been excellent and they regularly deal with us and say, okay, what kinds of problems have you had? 
you know, we keep a list for them and we can send them out so they know what's going on. And then they can look on the tech side of it to see is it something that we're doing wrong or something that, you know, the patients need to have help with. So I would say, you know, a good scheduling person, a good teletech person, um, some type of IT specialist to help, and then the providers as well to make sure that they're on board and, you know, we can kind of keep them happy and healthy and, and productive. So it, I haven't seen us having to, uh, things. Now, it was interesting because for a while during COVID-19, we stopped all of our inpatient overnight polysomnograms because we were trying to keep beds open. Uh, for those of you that are unaware, the VA is what's called the second level provider. And so in our communities, if the local facilities are overwhelmed by COVID, then by national decree, VA facilities are opened up to be secondary providers and we will see non-veteran patients if necessary. And in fact, this did happen to our uh, Detroit facility. They opened up and actually the VA there became a total COVID hospital situation. So to be able to kind of look at those kinds of things. So what we did was we started to do more home testing. And so we trained our uh, polysomnographers to help us in work during the day to be able to schedule these, contact the patients, help them get set up. Uh, to know what things so that we didn't have to furlough them or lay them off. And the only people that suffered are we have some PRN people and we just didn't use them for a while. So we've been very fortunate. That, that's good to hear. And, and you raise a good point that it really does take a team. Uh, you know, how often have I struggled with, with an individual who really doesn't know how to use the, the video system very well? If, if there was just someone, whether it be a nurse or a tech who could have intervened beforehand and made sure that that gentleman was was really set with the video system and then I could have just taken it right off and done the visit. So it really does take a group of people supporting those efforts and it's important to think about all of that as you go into the process now that we have a little more time to kind of think through it um, as to how to optimize these telemedicine systems which will likely be here in some form for a long time now. Um, so maybe that's, that's a good place to pause right now. Um, we have a number of topics still like billing and licensing to discuss, but I think they're going to have to wait till next time. So I want to thank, um, our panel and I want to, uh, encourage anyone to rejoin us for this second session, because I really look forward to continuing this fireside chat along with you. Thanks a lot.